Hi, I'm Hal Sutton, and today's going to be a lot of fun. We're fixing to try to learn a few new mental approaches to the game of golf. I'm going to try to teach you about making decisions on the golf course that will affect the way you play. There are many, many obvious decisions out there, like when you get on the green, it's obvious you're going to hit a putter. But it's all those gray areas. Is it a is the wind blowing left or right? Is it downhill? Is it uphill? Those are things that have to be factored into the way we play. That means you have different options that are available to you. And the one that you pick is going to affect your score. There are even options out there that you don't even know are out there. When you've done what I've done for 30 years as a profession, you learn a lot of things that a normal guy wouldn't learn. Today, you might get to actually play golf out of my eyes and see what I see. And that might teach you some things that you never knew before. And I'll tell you one of the other most important parts of this game is, is you've got to accept the results and move on. Playing golf in the present, forgetting about the past. One of the most important things in the game of golf, accepting the result and moving on to the next one. Another problem that all of y'all have, you've got to check your ego at the door. All of y'all want the tagline of the longest hitter at your club. That's not always the best thing. How about the tagline of, he's the smartest player in the club? I can tell you that the smartest player in the club is usually putting up the lowest scores. And isn't that why we're looking at this video? We want to shoot a lower score. I think it's going to be a fun day for you. There are many decisions out there to be made. I used to tell my dad all the time, how many decisions do you make in a day? I make 72 or less, hopefully. So I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to go out there and learn some of these things. We're going to have fun. So let's get started. something that we can accomplish and uh, you know your your goal might is certainly going to be different than my goal I can accomplish more because I do this for a living and you don't uh, you do other things and that's another point right there golf is an individual sport and what I mean by that is there's nobody out there making decisions for you when you're playing you're making all the decisions no input there can't be the rules say you can't have any help except for your caddy so uh, if you're playing tournament golf, that's what I do every day as a professional golfer. I'm alone out there. I'm making those decisions by myself. So I have to analyze what's wrong, what's right, what needs work, what doesn't need work. Now, in y'all's case, you're not playing golf all the time, but it's still an individual sport. So you're living your life. You're interacting with a lot of people. You're doing things at work that I wouldn't normally do. My work is my golf. So I'm in that alone mode and making my decisions by myself all the time. You're making decisions with people all the time and then moving into an individual sport of golf or you're making them by yourself. So you need to be aware of that. Why are we playing the game? Are we playing the game because for recreation? Are we playing the game because of someone else? Are we playing the game because of your child? You know, that'll help you set your goals as to why you're playing. The next thing is be truthful with yourself and ask the right questions. When you ask the right questions, if you are being truthful, you'll give some answers that you can make decisions on. You can reset your goals if you need to. And then the last thing you need to understand is there's no shortcut to playing better golf. It's a lot of hard work, it's knowledge, and then it's execution. And execution comes from enough time to practice what you've already learned and then being able to take it out on the golf course. All right, we're here at Boot Ranch, and one of the reasons why this was fun for me, is I was able to build Boot Ranch for what I saw was missing in the game today. 
I've got some trees right here and it seemed really odd that I would stand here and hit balls into that tree, but I'm teaching myself something. When I was captain of the Ryder Cup in 2004, Jackie Burke and I talked a lot, and I think he's the most informed, knowledgeable mind in the game today living. He is my mentor. He knows more than anybody I know. Now, he's yesteryear, and there's only so much you can learn from yesteryear. Modern day golf is also something to be learned. So what I mean by that is he knows how to hit the ball down and, and get on top of the ball and use the ground to maneuver the ball. The modern day player hits the ball in the air. They don't use the ground as much. It's far away. As far as you can hit it and go get the next one and hit it as far as you can hit it. And both have a place in the game. But to be a whole, we must know both. We can't know one, we're only half a player if we know one. If we know both, we're complete player. That's what Tiger Woods is. Tiger Woods can hit it under that tree, over that tree, through that tree. That's what we all want to know how to do. And he knows spine angle to do both. He knows to get his spine angle this way if he wants to hit it down. He knows to get his spine angle this way if he wants to hit it up. And he knows his spine angle for a perfect launch for him. If you go somewhere where you can hit a driver and experiment, and experiment with a tree, and you know the other beautiful part about this is we get so oriented in results of where the ball is going and what it's doing out there. This is fun because if we do this right, we hit it into the tree. Or we hit it at the top of the tree. Or if it goes over the tree, we still don't see it land. Isn't that a beautiful thing? We're working on something here, and our feedback is where it goes into the tree. Y'all do that all the time on accident. I'm telling you, do it on purpose this time. Go learn something. pre-game warm-up so let's talk about this like we were a football fan and what we would perceive that they might be doing they've got coaches that have already analyzed the team that they're about to play and the coaches are sitting in the pre-game warm-up talking about what they have to accomplish in order to beat this team golf is the same way I come out to the golf course I've already played a practice round I've got to be my own coach I've got to analyze and I've got to get ready for the game itself. So I'm gonna do some short game work. All I'm trying to do is I'm trying to feel the speed of the greens and the firmness of the greens. I'm not trying to get precise. I move over to the driving range. I know what I need to do. I'm gonna warm up first. I'm gonna to try to get the arms married to the body. I see a lot of you guys go to the driving range and you take two or three clubs out. As you can tell, I've got my whole bag here. You know, when you take two or three clubs out, y'all usually start with your sand wedge or pitching wedge or whatever it is and you know you're so stiff you can't even get it back so you just arm it back. I try not to do that at all. I try to do this sort of motion where the body turns when the arms move. If you just arm it back the arms get behind you. And we all know to lead with our body so the arms stay behind you and you block it all day. Whatever you do on the driving range normally you take to the golf course with you so let's try not to do that. When I start warming up, I warm up with a lob wedge and I hit little shots, as I said, just making my body and my arms flow together. And I work my way up into the bag. I usually hit a few intermediate wedges and then I move into the pitching wedge before I hit the first full shot. And the reason for that is, is I'm trying to make sure that I'm doing simple stuff. I'm not moving a lot so that my body can stay with my arms. Our body doesn't want to move to begin with. That's the stiff part of us. So make sure you get it moving. Uh, when I get to the driving range, I've already decided if I need to try to be drawing the ball or if I need to fade the ball for the golf course that day. So I'm gonna work that into my 
pre-game warm-up. If I need to hit some cuts, I'm going to be cutting it on the driving range. If I need to draw it, I'm going to be drawing it on the driving range. I'm trying to simulate what I've got to do on the golf course when I'm out here getting ready and warming up. You know, I work my way all the way up to a driver. I don't usually hit a lot of shots with a driver. Harvey Pinnock told me a long time ago that, you know, we've got to hit 14 good drivers out on the golf course, and that's a lot of energy. Let's not use them up on the, on the driving range before we go. So if I hit one or two good drives, that might be all the drivers you see me hit. And that might be a good idea for y'all. You know, we don't have to finish on a bad one. We need to finish on a good one. And if the good one is in the first couple, let's call it a day and let's take it out on the driving range. I take it out on the golf course. But essentially, let's recap here what I said. We're gonna come out, we're gonna do some little short game warm, warm up to begin with, and all we're trying to do is feel the greens and feel the firmness. We're gonna move over here and we're gonna get our arms married to our body. We're gonna hit little shots. We're gonna work our way up into the bag. If we need to hit a draw, we're gonna work on some draws. If we need to hit a fade, we're gonna work on that. We're gonna hit a few drivers. We're gonna get married, again, arms to the body. Once we've got all that done, we're moving to the golf course. So we can go play our best round ever. All right, we've got a great par four here that's a risk reward type of shot. I've got a caddy normally, my bag's sitting right here. I evaluate the shot. Into this, I'm taking into consideration how far I want to hit it, where all the trouble is at, uh, what the wind condition is, and I reach in my bag, it's all right here for me. Y'all usually are coming from a golf cart. A lot of y'all just want to get it as close to the green as you can, and you just bypass all the steps that I just told you about. Not a good idea. It's not good for scoring. That may be just satisfaction to you to hit it a long ways. I think we're out here to learn how to play better. Playing better is choosing the right club, taking the least risk, and still getting it as close to the green as you can. So the first thing I'm looking at is, where's the wind? I know how far I want to hit it. If I don't want to take any risk, this is a four iron shot. If I want to take more risk, I can go on and hit a driver over all the bunkers. I can't quite get it to the green. This is a Great opportunity for me to tell you my philosophy is if I can't put it on the putting surface, it's not worth the gamble to me. It's going to take two shots to get there anyway. I'm pretty good with a wedge. You know, some guys can chip it better than others. In this particular case, this is a very lofted lob type chip shot to a blind putting surface. Very difficult shot. I think the play is to lay it back. So I'm starting to figure out how far I want to hit it. A 200 yard shot is the best that I. I don't want to hit it any further than 200 yards, and that's a four iron for me. So now I'm looking at the angles of the hole. Left side is where I don't want to be, so I'm going to tee it up on that side of the fairway, on that side of the tee, for hitting for the opposite side of the fairway. So I've given myself the best angle I can give myself at that. All right, this is a four iron shot. I've given myself the right angle on the left hand side here. And now I'm just going to hit the 200 shot, 200 yard shot that we're looking for here. I executed it just like I wanted to. 200 yard shot, right hand side of the fairway. If you do the same thing, give yourself the angles, evaluate the trouble, evaluate the wind. Make sure the angle is correct for you and then just hit the shot and accept the results. Here we are at the 10th hole and uh, it's a little bit of a scary shot for every average player. It's a force carry, 82 yards to a front pin. Penalty's high if we leave it short. So every time I look at a shot like this, I'm mainly trying to make sure that I've got enough club to be behind the hole. Yeah, I've strengthened my game over the years has been my, my iron game probably, and it's not necessarily because I strike the ball good all the time. It's I play the highest percentage shot. I try to keep from short siding myself, and in this case, the water is a, a large penalty. So we're gonna play behind the hole, and you know, in an 82-yard shot, that's a little beyond my lob wedge, and my in-between wedge is, uh, a little bit too much club. So I'm gonna pull the bigger club and go at it easy. Make sure that I compress the ball and hit it solid. Uh, that's what I think everybody out there should do. Don't get afraid of it, pull enough club, 
hit it beyond the hole and uh, try to make a 20 footer. carry here there's ball, uh, water in front of the green pins on the right hand side of the green and the ball is below my feet the possibility of short siding yourself is more whenever you've got these circumstances where the balls below your feet and the pins on the right so be careful of that short siding it means you miss it to the short side which is on the right side and you don't have very much green to work with and we don't want to do that in order to play better golf you need to stay away from short siding yourself and give yourself a little room I've got my bag here. I'm going to pretend like there's a caddy here for you, and I'm going to kind of go through what I would normally do subconsciously. I'm going to try to bring it to the conscious level so that y'all can hear what I'm doing here. First thing I would do is get my yardage. There's a sprinkler right there, and it says 112 yards, so I was a few yards off. We're 110 here, and I don't know where the pin is on the green, so we're just going to pretend it's a 110-yard shot. Uh, I always shoot at the top of the pin. I never shoot at the bottom of the pin unless the pin is in the back of the green. I'm certain that all of y'all shoot at the pin and more than likely the hole. Everybody gets so hole conscious. And this is a good point for me to bring out right now. I always move the hole where I need it to be. It can be at the top of the pin or if the pin is cut so much that to one side that I think the risk is too great, I move the pin to the middle of the green. In my mind, that's where I move the pin. It's hard to do that. You must think about that, and you got to hone in on that the best you can. Uh, but I can tell you the penalty is high if you don't do that sort of thing. We've got a 110-yard shot. I'd pull a wedge out. I wouldn't hit a, a sand wedge. And like I said, I hit it at the top of the pin, so a little bit more club in this situation. The first thing my caddy would say is the ball's below your feet, so pay attention to that. We've already distinguished that. I'm going to line this shot up. I'm going to get behind it and I'm going to uh, pick out a spot that's six to, eight, six to eight inches in front of it and that's where I'm going to hit it at. For me on this shot, since I've got a wedge, I'm going to hit it right at the flag. For y'all, there's a leaning tree in the background that's more in the center of the green. That would be the better target for y'all here. Uh, we've got a little bit of breeze behind us and that needs to be factored into it also. And Let's just hit this shot and see what we come up with here. recap what we just went over there. We're not going to short side ourselves. We're going to pay attention to our slope of the, the lie here. The ball's below my feet here. We're going to hit enough club and we're going to not worry about where the pin is at. We're going to kind of move the pin over into the middle of the green. And if you do that, it's worked well for me for the last 30 years. I bet it's going to work well for you. into the chipping and pitching part of the game and one of the things that I think playing better golf is is understanding what your strengths and your weaknesses are. You know this has never been one of the best parts of my game. Uh, you can call it whatever you want. When I was young I thought it was a if you were chipping a lot that meant the rest of your game wasn't very good so I worked on my longer game and it showed throughout my career I was a better ball striker than I ever was chipper. But there were other people like Seve Ballesteros that wasn't as good a ball striker and you couldn't put him in a place that he couldn't get it up and down. So when I'm out there hitting a shot into the green, I don't want to short side myself. So let me explain what short siding is. Short siding means if you hit the shot to the side of the green that the pin is closest to, then you've short sided yourself. You've got to hit a lob shot or a lofted shot to get it close. If you don't short side yourself, then you've given yourself room to pitch the ball and let the ball run out. Uh, those are easier shots normally than having to hit the, the lofted shot or the lob shot. Uh, you know, Jack Nicholas was my idol. 
and as far as I'm concerned, he's a friend too, but he's always been way up here as me, and I never really wanted to look at him like he had a weakness. But he said out of his own mouth, this was not the best part of his game. Now, what he was the very best at was managing his golf game. So he took care of making sure he didn't get this very much back there. And But you can't always avoid this. So when you get this shot, all you can do is keep your body moving. Most mistakes come when the body stops and the arms go. So if you want to play better golf, understand your strengths and understand your weaknesses too. Be conscious of both. Play to your strengths, play away from your weaknesses. When you can't avoid where you're weak at, make sure your body is always moving. That'll make you play better golf. Well, we've made our way over to the putting green. I've got about an 18 foot putt. It's downhill from one level to the next, so speed is an issue. It's got quite a bit of break on it, so break is an issue. And here's one of the common things that I see everybody do in a pro-am. They just look at the hole. That's not good enough. That might give you some sort of feel for the distance, but the last look that you make needs to be at the peak of the arc, wherever the you think is the maximum amount it's going to break. That's where you're going to aim the ball, and that's where you're going to look the last time. If you look at it twice, which you probably will, the first time you're going to look for, at the hole for the speed, the second time, which is the last, you look at the peak of the arc. That's what Crenshaw did better than anybody. That's why he made so many long breaking putts. Another thing that I think is really a good idea for all of y'all is you're normally playing with people. Watch them putt on the green. If there's anybody in the vicinity of you, watch them putt. Watch their stroke. Watch how hard they hit it. Your brain will factor into that and it'll make some difference in your putt. Lastly, one of the things that I know all of you are doing is your eyes moving when you're putting. You're not watching the ball. You know, we all get stroke conscious. We're thinking about trying to make the putt. We want to make a perfect stroke, so we watch the putter. Terrible mistake. It will result in a missed putt every time. So here's what I do. I set the ball on where the, I play a Titleist ball. I set it down where I'm looking at Titleist. I'm reading Titleist the whole time I'm making the stroke. When the putter starts when the putter starts back, I'm not watching it go back. When the putter starts forward, I'm not watching the ball go forward. I'm trying to read Titleist the whole time until Titleist is not there. And if you do those things, if you watch the peak of the arc and you watch your other players in the group and then you keep your eye steady on the ball, I'm certain you're going to putt better. Card and I just signed that card and when I do that I'm thinking about what all went into that score and I think it's really important that we analyze what went on today. One of the things that might take place, it certainly does in my mind, is I go over the stats for the day and I do that in my head. They keep it on the tour for us and they tell us how many fairways we hit and how many greens we hit and whether we got it up and down out of the bunker or not and how many putts we had. And you know that already in your head. I don't have a real affinity for that because I think it tells us too much and we get too locked in I'm on just trying to hit the fairway or just trying to hit the green. Uh, that's not what we're really out there for. We're out there to score, shoot the lowest score we can. A lot of the time I'm aimed at the left side of the fairway. If, you, if you're aimed at one side of the fairway or the other and you get a bad bounce, it might end up in the rough. They show that as a missed fairway. I can't look at it like that because I did what I needed to do. So honesty in your post round evaluation, honesty to yourself about what really happened is what you really need. You need to evaluate the good bounces, the bad bounces. Did you hit the good shot or was it really a bad shot? When you do that and you're really honest with yourself, you can make better decisions about what you need to bring to the golf course with you tomorrow, which will make a lower score in the long run. golf course with me today and uh, learning a little bit about the mental side of golf. You know, we started on the driving range and we worked our way to the first tee jitters and 
we went on around and we figured out strategy and we figured out risk reward. We figured out where we need to tee, what side of the tee box we need to tee it up on. We figured out multiple shots to play. And uh, I think we're all going to be better golfers from this. You know, one of the things that I was probably most noted for was be the right club today whenever I beat Tiger the last day. But I think I need to explain to y'all what that really meant. It's, it's all encompassing. It's everything that went into that. It's months of preparing to be at your best. And it's a passionate moment. When I said that, it was totally out of passion. I was spent at that time. But nobody knew all the things that went into that moment. So some of the things that we've done today came together over 30 years, actually. We're, we've condensed it into one round here, but this was all my learning over 30 years. That particular year, I was paired with Tiger in uh, Los Angeles and I told my caddy at the beginning of the week I said I really want to play the best I can play I want to beat Tiger here somewhere down the road we're gonna have to come to we're gonna be paired with him in the last round and we're gonna try to beat him and so I did beat Tiger the first two rounds in the LA Open that year and to me it sent a message to me hey you're capable I don't know whether he paid any attention I beat him so he knew I was playing pretty good we get down to TPC that week. I was really playing well. I knew I was. I led the very first day. And every time I went in the media center that week, this was Tiger Woods I was playing, you know. I'm supposed to lose to him. The media was setting me up each day to have an out, you know, when are you going to fold? And every day I would go in there and listen to this. I led the whole way from start to finish. And Every day they'd go in and say, well, we expect you to fall tomorrow. Not really. That's not really what they said, but that's in essence what they were saying. And finally I got fed up with it the last round before I went in, and I, I mean uh, on Saturday evening, and I said, you know what, guys? I said, you know, when I got down to pray this morning, I realized that I wasn't praying to Tiger Woods, so everything's going to be okay. But there was another side to that story. I had prepared for a long time to get to that moment, and that was my moment and I was trying to seize my moment. So all the tools that we've given y'all today, I feel like are tools that can be your moment, your preparation, how you can be better to beat the person that you want to beat. Being the right club today is a process or a journey. And understand that there will be failures in it, there will be setbacks, but keep going back to this video, keep processing everything that we've said. You're going to learn something each and every time you look at this video. Every time you see it, you'll say, oh yeah, I forgot about that. I need to incorporate that. Go incorporate it. But remember, this is a journey. There is no destination. We want to see how good we can be. I want to thank you all for your time. I hope this does you all a lot of good. And I look forward to seeing you on the golf course somewhere down the road.